Thank you, Cosmin. I think you read a biography from 2007, but that doesn't matter. Um, I said something else to Ethan. Uh, it's okay. Uh, hello, um, Hong Kong. I'm sorry uh, not to be there. Uh, um, hello to, to the friends and to the people that I won't have the uh, uh, chance to meet. Um, but I will rely uh, solely on uh, the the oratory because I don't have images and I don't have um, a PowerPoint to show. So I hope that, and in any case, if you don't at any moment understand uh, if it's beyond comprehensibility, please uh, interrupt me and then uh, we will restart. Okay? I don't see you, so you have to say something. Yeah. Hello? Yes. Okay. I assume that it is okay. Yes, it's okay. I don't okay. hear anything. Yes. Okay. There might be a delay. So the fact that this forum takes place in Hong Kong, uh, I see as an advantage um, of a remote location, which is off Western Euro-American Center for a task that I will undertake here, uh, which I promised to Cosmin and Anna, and that is how to represent in a reflective summary what it is that foregrounded contemporary dance and performance in Europe in the past two decades, let's say from the mid-90s until today. So this development which precedes and pre prepares the performance turn in visual arts and curating practices as this conference uh, refers to it. So I'll make a bilan, as they would say in French, um, uh, a historical assessment, checkup, a retrospective diagnosis of problems, actors, events, context, situations and concepts which are likely to be familiar to those working within the field of contemporary dance and performance, but perhaps might be uh, neglected from a larger uh, perspective of uh, visual arts accommodating dance and performance today. Of course, that's a huge task, uh, which I need to narrow, uh, and I will focus um, on the transformation of the discipline and practice of dance by way of theory, which might answer one of the questions posed by this conference call, and it, and it is dance as a new field of discourse and thinking. Um, let's say that in simpler terms, it would mean how um, to speak about how dance came of age, uh, proving that it is capable of a certain kind of thought born out of its own practice, how it acquired its own epistemy, or how it started to be taken more seriously than before. Now, uh, I should uh, disclose my own position, uh, which is, um, let's say, not just a sheer contingency or happy coincidence between the moment when the field was undergoing this encroachment, this invasion of what is referred to as critical theory or continental philosophy or post-structuralism, and my entering the field of contemporary dance as a double outsider. Uh, what do I mean by this? Um, a, a dilettante, because I had no professional formation in dancing, uh, but I was equipped with critical theory as a political weapon in, in my native context, and a non-Westerner. So coming from a context uh, of Eastern Europe, um, of former Yugoslavia, which didn't recognize or foster contemporary dance, but where dance, to use the term of uh, Janis Janschup, pierced through other arts, other experimental art practices. And so, I've never done this before, eh, to speak over Skype on a conference that is so far away. So I'll, I'll try to be concise and uh, easy to follow. So I'll present this bilan, this account, in um, four um, cluster of um, points or thesis. So, if we look at the situation of European dance in the early 1990s, uh, we could qualify it as one of um, vacancy, of um, a lack of explicit self-determined discourse and theorization of its own specific poetics, concepts, medium, historicity, institutional practices that would be comparable with literature, cinema, performance art, even music then. There are probably many ways to describe this, uh, but my take on this problem now would be uh, that dance was uh, replete with a 
several phenomena, tendencies, which acted as, let's say, epistemological obstacles. Uh, one is the uh, formalism, which I guess is the plague of all arts, uh, but formal abstraction after Merce Cunningham and Tisha Brown. Uh, then, let's say, the dominance of the aesthetic categories um, in authorship where style um, was seen as uh, idiosyncrasy, like in the works of Antares de Kessmark or Forsyth or in London Deviate. Or the third one would be some kind of particular choreographic authorial paranoia, uh, which kept work uh, hermetic, as in Pina Bausch, uh, where words were considered to dirty the magic of creation. Then something that I also uh, just heard in, in, in the previous talk, a kind of dichotomous thinking, um, which uh, stems from the mind-body problem uh, and which always sees uh, dance in kind of binary categories, uh, either pure dance or dance, dance theater or pure dance and conceptual dance or now choreography or dance. And the fourth one would be a kind of new age surge of somatic practices. Um, so uh, all the radical experiments from the 70s, uh, American neo-avant-garde, that became immunized in the 80s and 90s, like contact improvisation, authentic movement, BMC, and so on. I would regard these as epistemological obstacles that define the situation of the beginning of the 90s before this, uh, what I would call epistemological break that happened. Because they kept dance hermetic, um, away from anybody who didn't have um, empirical privilege of access. So dance had the status of uh, Wittgenstein's private language, meaning untranslatable to other arts and practices because it relates to those experiments which are opaque and inaccessible to those who didn't share the same experiences. So it was a techné without an episteme. So second point. So what happened in the 90s um, that set the conditions um, of possibility of an episteme um, or for this epistemological break or set the historical ground for other knowledge and practices in dance? And why this happened only in the mid-90s or since mid-90s? Was this timely or was it late? And I think we can recount this in three shifts. Uh, the first would be um, historical materialist aspect of um, changing relations of production, uh, which set in in the 90s, uh, meaning uh, freelance, a style of working, project-based, which meant also dismantling and fragmenting oeuvre uh, to individual works where each one reiterates a differential gesture of examining, experimenting what movement and dancing body could do rather than be. Uh, then authors and not their works uh, becoming immaterial spectacular commodities, for instance, like Jérôme Bell. Um, then also separation from local community, uh, where the scenes and contexts uh, began to wither, um, in which an author belongs, towards networking in an internationalized field or market with booming infrastructures uh, for dance. Now, second um, aspect of this shift is perhaps the ideological shift in the aftermath of 1989, but not in terms of Fukuyama's end of history ideology, but as um, uh, setting the uh, condition of possibility of a critique of dance's essentialism, uh, meaning um, an essentialist approach uh, to dance where dance is self-evident and doesn't need to um, explain or justify or um, uh, see its definition as um, contingent. So the 90s made possible an aesthetic and conceptual pluralism, but not of a liberal kind, an experimental relativism, uh, where each uh, dance proposition sets itself as contingent. Uh, there was also an influx of um, critical theory and art practices from Eastern Europe, uh, aside from Western art system, which invested in the autonomy of the work.
Now, the third aspect of the shift or the, the who done it question is it is who 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 is behind it, uh, who made it possible also. Uh, what's the individual agency of, of uh, choreographers and artists. And I would um, suggest that these were outsiders in terms of um, dilettantes or, or radical amateurs um, who contested dance as a weak discipline by a bluffing mixture of ignorance and impertinence. So substituting another artistic genealogy uh, for professional dance training or formation. So making a leap into the history of the 60s and 70s neo-avant-garde um, and, and particularly Judson Dance Theatre, uh, which, if Skype allows me to contend, uh, was a greater benefit of a deferred action, a historically delayed effect, than the recent projects of reconstruction and, and reenactment um, under the auspices of the resurrected boss ladies from Judson. Now, if I would name the who done it, uh, you already have some of these people in, 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 in your conference. Perhaps I don't need to uh, reiterate their names, but we could add also Tino Segal, Antonia Bear. Uh, but then also uh, the choreographers who were trained in dance but stepped out of this uh, narrow essentialist, uh, craftsmanship oriented, technocentric horizon of dance, like uh, Vera Mantero, Larry Bot, Esther Salomon, Matt Ingwertz, and Juan Dominguez, Boris Shamatz. I think I should name all, all these because otherwise it stays uh, mysterious and abstract. Now, um, my third point, what was novel about thinking that took over and filled the vacancy, this empty space I described? And I would distinguish two phases or two paradigms that, um, that are also phases in a temporal sense that roughly correspond to one, would be um, a horizontal expansion of a broad and diverse spectrum of critical theory, post-structuralism, continental philosophy, uh, which was referred to as conceptual methodologies in, in dance and performance. Um, and if we would list this march through theory that happened from the mid-90s um, until, let's say, 2000, 2000s, 2005, then it's you know, the genre of lecture performances with intertextuality, um, then late semiotic signifying practices um, where heterogeneous uh, multiplicity of movements and bodies was staged, deconstructions, theory uh, of subjectivity, schizoanalysis of capitalism, feminism, queer critique, uh, cinematography. Um, and this is where we can locate uh, the refuge uh, of dance uh, for other performing arts because dance could give the body to or make physically thick the problems that neither theater nor performance art did so well or could do anymore. So it also uh, marked a turn from, turn away from the textual speech act kind of hailing in the ideology of representation to the effective experiential, experiential embodiment which appeared more real um, in those times, in those times of the obsession with the real. So that would be maybe one, um, let's say, uh, line of thought, one kind of thought that uh, uh, developed um, around uh, 2000. Uh, but what I would be more inclined to um, defend uh, and argue for here is that the best of the works of dance made in the last two decades have affirmed another kind of thought, which I wouldn't um, refer to as conceptualization of choreography, but which I would call after Spinoza and Deleuze expressive rather than representative. So where creation comprises posing problems, prob making, performing, attending performance, problems whose temporary solutions give rise to distinctive concepts, concepts of its own. Now, these concepts that I refer to exp as expressive concepts of dance, they express problems by way of which new relationships between bodies, movement, time, sensation, 
and thought are composed. Now, let me mention some of them uh, so, so that you get a more tangible uh, idea of it. Um, how to defigure human body, not non-identity of the body, or the agency of movement compounded of body and machine, or imperceptible movement, or indiscernibility between stillness, motion, inertia, between live bodies or inanimate objects, um, the problem of motion and cessation faster than its recognition, uh, the problem of movement which goes neither from nor towards, uh, that is equivalent of posing questions. How can uh, movement pose questions by movement? The problem of dancing in the head of the spectator. These are some. Now, this new relationship between the body and movement and duration are based on the rupture of the synthesis between the body and movement, um, which in modern dance throughout the 20th century has been established through an organic regime which is twofold. Uh, this organic regime is either subjectivation of the dancer through self-expression, emotive self-expression, and that's this romanticist curse of dance always being about dancing one's own life, and objectivation of movement uh, through the physical expression of the dancing body, which is inherited from ballet uh, to formal abstraction, the body of a Cartesian machine. Now, from this expressive logic of thought, I would like to single out two important concepts with which contemporary dance uh, in the last decade contributes to philosophical thinking of the body movement. One is uh, the disjunctive capture between the body and the machine. Um, machine understood not as a mechanical device, but as an artificial, non-organic logic of movement. As a divided agency, agency of part bodies, part machines, the agency of movement compounded of body and machine, which is neither subject nor object, but pertains to a network situation. And the second one is uh, the notion of attention or attending to duration. And this might be perhaps interesting for uh, um, uh, the issue of um, bringing, uh, presenting dance and performance in museums. So let me dwell on this for a moment, this last one. Performance is attended when it is approached from the aspect of time. So time becomes that which prevents everything from being given at once. This is a nice convenient phrase from uh, Henri Bergson, the French philosopher of duration. So attending a performance that involves perception of bodily movement entails an experience of attuning to performer's movements, one's perception and capacity to perceive. A great difference between the movement performed and the movement perceived by the attender, and I here call the spectator the attender, um, who is still, may engender an asymmetry by which attending gives rise to its proper problems. This asymmetry between performing and attending could be considered within the distinction that Henri Bergson makes between automatic or habitual, and attentive recognition. Now, I will briefly explain what this means for the perception of movements. So when performing, the performer's perception is usually subtractive, uh, like it is in everyday life when we move. That is, it extends itself into those movements which will have useful effects. And there the sensory motor mechanisms enacted to produce certain bodily movements in space, the habits which are constituted and accumulated in practice and repetition, when in the very movement of performers, the sensory motor mechanism is broken, for instance, in a performance which thrives on a non-habitual, extremely decelerated movement, for instance, then the performer becomes perceiver of her own body and the attender, the perceiver of this perception. Tentative recognition occurs when the perceiver 
can't extend her perception into habitual movement. And revert to the inside space of the body so as to extract sensations from it. The attender's gaze becomes attentive because it returns to inspect the body again and again in search of a perceptible change. Thus, the attender seems to describe the same image over, picking out different features, attuning to the detail. But the status of her perceptions is provisional, in question, for she can't anticipate any movement and registers them only as they have lapsed. Now, in this uh, with this, I would like to come to my last point and elaborate a little more on temporality in attending to dance and associate it with the question of why dance is attractive to visual arts today and other issues regarding labor and value of dance and performance presented in museums. Now, in a slight difference to uh, the opening question of this conference, is the living body the last thing left alive. I would argue that it isn't the dancing or performing body's liveness that is its ontohistorical characteristic and symbolic value, even if it is uh, often um, capitalized like that. It is neither the movement as the evidence of physical reality that would be a pledge of vitalism, which makes dance more appealing than theater, for instance. It is the time required for producing and repeating movement and for the perception of change. The duration which implicates the tender, theater spectator or museum visitor, not only in the present, but also in the future in which it doesn't disappear. It is a process that makes the past persist in the present and resonate in future for which the living body is just a vehicle, a proxy perhaps more persuasive and implicating the attender than an exhibited video on loop. The theater apparatus commands the daily economy of time calibrated by the modes of attention exercised in evening entertainment, cinema, concert. This doesn't deny the legacy of theater as agora, but conflates the role of the audience with an assembly of witnesses to a scene in protocols that regulate consensus uh, and that silence discussion and reduce it to bar talk. This is why for a choreographer or a theater maker uh, or performance maker, an exhibition offers a whole other set of possibilities of organizing time, individuation of the visitor, an encounter between the visitor and the dancer or performer, which can be regulated by a loose protocol outside of the mirroring contract of the theater stage. So it also allows another scale of anonymity and massiveness in the circulation of visitors. And these are all alluring advantages of the museum apparatus. But they aren't free from the material conditions that underscore and complicate this affair. So in mounting a dance and a performance as an exhibition, and I've been witness and collaborating on some, and not as a, an event out of the ordinary progression, something like hors série performance in the museum, uh, two modes of performance are undercut, making and performing as two differential structures that condition the genesis of performance with their two divergent temporalities and processes. Since the value of dance and performance is still imaginary, uh, that is, nobody can formulate a standard ratio between, on the one hand, the wages for the daily labor of performing oneself as an exhibit, and on the other hand, uh, the value of the resultant work, oeuvre, which is difficult to sell as a collector's item, the high expenses of the labor force of the dancing bodies can't be easily justified. Uh, Dino Zegel famously contended 
that Richard Serra's matter of time becomes cheaper in time, while his own work keeps the same high price. And I would add, if he kept the same aging performance, performers, it would become even more expensive. The choreographer gives in to the pressure of neoliberal policies of curating by trying to diminish the costs through de-skilling, hiring cheap labor of ever younger dancers who seek an opportunity to embellish their CVs, while youthful sexiness is their main asset. Um, forgive me for being blunt here, but I had to say this. Uh, from my point of perspective... Just, just a little this, note that there's five minutes left. N normally I'm, we would have like been more discreetly, but it's... Uh, yes. <laughs> it's okay. Uh, from my point of perspective, this points to a regressive restitution of the aesthetic ideals of ballet, revamped through the neoliberal experience economy. But I don't want to appear as moralizing here because there is yet another issue which might be more politically ambivalent, and this is what I'm going to end with. Uh, if we are to think again and extend the diagnosis of dance performance entering the museums to the claim that dance just might be the art that best epitomizes the forms of labor and life today, then we should be able to understand the regulative idea under which dance does this job of history or its political unconscious. And my speculative answer to the question would be the following. Dance and choreography uh, do something more specific, more specialized and refined than performance in a general sense. Now, the currency that performance as a technical term had in uh, the 90s to 2000s, like in uh, John McKenzie's um, a famous book, Perform or Else, seems now to be replaced by choreography. Now, comparing their usages, we can infer that performance denotes competence, ability to execute and achievement, while choreography designates dynamic patterns of the complicated yet seamless organization of many heterogeneous elements in motion. Choreography stresses the design of procedures that regulate a process. It can be a process of diplomacy, a chemical process, or IT. Choreography can be reduced to the regulative idea of function here. While dance provides embodiment, or more specifically, the metaphor of a corporeal and social lubricant, a surplus of grace that smooths the functioning of choreography. When we enter the museum and the work of dance pops up in front of us in disturbing proximity, this occurrence, the movements, the bodies, the encounter, the responsibility for the situation that we feel as spectators, visitors, merges with the exhibition apparatus or even supplants its protocol. The arising problem is the following. What is the social choreography we are participating in? Who is the choreographer? Is it the curator um, or the author of the movement who has delegated the role of curating my experience as an attender, visitor? And what is the script, what is the choreography going to produce here? If I as the attender am to participate rather than contemplate a dance performance as a vitalized object, what forces me to shape the sociality of the choreography I'm dancing in? How am I not to take it as one more, albeit intensified and aestheticized experience of the self? Perhaps this might be the problem that choreographers, dramaturges, curators should try to solve against alignment with neoliberal policies of participation. That's it. That's my communique. Thank you.